and welcome back to the podcast, y'all. We had a couple of stories breaking overnight, and I wanted to come on as I am still working on several listener requests. And I want to talk about the breaking news surrounding the Sean Puffy Combs story. So we have now learned from Sean's attorney, Mark Anifalo, that Sean will be testifying in his criminal case. He wants to, according to Mark, quote, defend himself, close quote. And um, what has happened is that TMZ, they have made a very short documentary, excuse me, on the indictment that is to air tonight, Thursday night on Tubi. They've spoken to Mark. They've spoken to several other people. And Mark tells this story. He says that Sean is chomping at the bit to get on the stand. Mark also says The only person who's really fit to defend Diddy is Diddy. Now, it's brought to Mark's attention what a gamble this is because of the cross-examination. How will he explain the video when he's asked? How will he explain all these things that the feds will have evidence of? Mark says he understands what a great gamble it is, but they're willing to take the gamble because of what Puffy has to share. Now, let me give you my commentary on that, and I can't wait to read your thoughts on it. Well, I will tell y'all, I actually understand um, what he's probably going to say, even though we haven't heard it yet, and I know that sounds crazy. Um, I'm thinking, I guess, um, about past experiences that I had when I was an investigative interviewer. I'm going to tell y'all something, and I, I I want you to try to stay with me, okay? That doesn't mean agree with me. I want you to hear that correctly, okay? I just mean, let me explain it. When people like Sean, who are horrible, okay, when they know that the person accusing them of whatever the crime is, whatever the victimization is, really wasn't a victim, but rather has positioned him or herself as a victim, they are willing to tell that. They will say this, 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 and this, because remember, he was recording, which means he wasn't probably just recording the acts. He may have been recording meetings, business calls, contract negotiations between these people who in the public sphere have positioned him or herself as victims. Remember, in terms of Cassie, according to Jaguar Wright, and I know Jaguar is highly suspect, okay? There was a contract that these girls had, a written contract, When it came to Cassie, her initial pay allegedly was uh, half a million dollars, $500,000. Then when Sean brought on other girls that he was hiring for the freak offs, hiring to be his girlfriend, hiring to be his arm candy, all those things, he dropped her down to $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars. And she did not like that. She got very angry. So she, you know, tried to renegotiate her contract and he wasn't hearing it. So she left. She left. Well, and that was okay with him because, well, he had several other people at that point. And uh, Jaguar said a whole lot more, but I'm just summarizing it. So if he has proof of that, if he has proof of that, that will mean She wasn't a victim. Now, let me stop and say this, because I know some of you have not been with us this whole year. When I say us, I mean me and the beautiful uh, MVMO community. We've been talking about Sean and covering him in various and sundry ways for a year. So you haven't heard everything. So when you hear me say uh, something that I've said numerous times that I will not change, there's nothing that can be said that's going to make me change it because I have 18 years of experience. I don't just have the book knowledge about abuse and how these things work with people. I actually have real world experience with various people, men and women across races, ages. And I know from experience, there are different types of victims. A person, a man or a woman can be a victim of an incident of rape or of violence but not be a victim holistically in the situation or the relationship. Those are two different things. For instance, 
Kim Porter, in my view, my opinion, was not a victim holistically. Was she a victim of incidents of violence, of beatings? Yes. But she was not a victim holistically. She was in the relationship of her own will. It wasn't a power dynamic. It wasn't a control. She wanted the things that she wanted. And her negotiation was, I'm willing to take the whippings, the beatings, the cheatings, because I'm getting X, Y, and Z. And because I don't want to give up X, Y, and Z, I understand this is what I'm going to have to trade for it. When you come from utter poverty, where you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, when you had to eat out of trash cans, dumpster dive, etc., you never, ever want to go back down to that. If you have a history of abuse, of course, it makes you more susceptible to these types of mental negotiations. One of the things that Roger Bonds said in his Vlad TV interview is this, because see, men can't say what I'm saying, because if a man says what I'm saying, all the women jump on them. See, I don't care if all the women jump on me. See, I know I've talked to and interviewed many a woman. I've driven them myself to many a shelter. For instance, something else I'll tell you that may shock you. No woman ever really stays for her children. See, that's just what a lot of women say. And well, who's going to argue with that? Because, well, the logic is a woman loves her children enough to take anything. But no, that's not true. Every woman who's ever said, I said, I stayed in this relationship because of my children. I stayed in the abusive, whether the abuse was financial, emotional, physical, verbal. They know in their conscience the real reason they stayed. Now, they may have convinced themselves it was for their children, but that's not true. I'm telling you what I know. So let's get back to Roger. So he said that several times when he witnessed Whitney uh, Diddy beating Kim, he said Kim started fighting back. He started noticing she was fighting back. She was scratching back. She was slapping back all these things. So he said, I had tried to help her get out of that so many times. He said, and then one day Kim told him, you know, I'm going to leave when I get tired of it. He'll know when I'm tired of it. He'll know when I'm tired. I let him do all the cheating. I let him do all the beatings, you know, and you know what? But he'll know when I'm tired of it. And then he said one time Puffy had some event Puffy had to go to. And he, he slapped Kim and he was about to hit her again. But Kim said, if you hit me again, I'm going to put a scratch on your face so big that you're going to have to explain that scratch at this event. Well, of course, that put him in check. And he said, puppy didn't hit her. And then she walked off. Now, I want you to come out of your emotions. I want you to come out of your own personal experience as a victim in your mind. And I want you to really look at that honestly. I want you to be intellectually honest right now. Was that a woman who was a victim holistically or a victim of the abuse? People who only have the book knowledge of abuse and how the thing works, the power dynamic, the this or that, but they have zero real world experience. Experience matters. Real world experience beyond your own does matter. Real world experience matters more than the book stuff. Being in the trenches of folks' lives can give you something you cannot get from no book, no seminar, no degree. Those words were the words of a woman who was in that relationship because of what she wanted. You know, let me tell you something that you're going to hear on 50 Cent's Netflix documentary when it comes out. There's going to be a man and there's several. This is just one that spoke out. Now, I want you to get out of your emotions right now. Push neutral. Stop typing. Get out of your emotions. Stop being triggered and reactive. I want you to listen to this. There's going to be a man who's going to say he's going to tell his story. He wanted to be a famous rapper. That's what he wanted. He wanted it no matter what he had to do. Now, he won't tell you that part, but he'll just say, I wanted it. Right. Because that was how I was going to feed my family. So Puffy pushed up on him and told him. If he wanted to go any further in his career, he would have to bend over. And you're going to hear this man say, I did it because I was trying to feed my family. Is he a victim of sexual abuse? Which is what he's going to claim on the Netflix documentary, that he was sexually abused by Puffy as well. No, his quote unquote 
desire to feed his family, which see, this is called positioning yourself as a victim when you really weren't. See, that is positioning yourself as a victim. Let's think this through. First of all, you can feed your family without bending over. You may not want to be able to feed them the way you want to feed them. They may not be able to eat steaks and potatoes, but they can eat spaghetti and meatballs. But see, you've been close to it now. You've seen the real lifestyle. You've seen what is possible. You've seen the money. You've seen the access to power, the access to celebrities, being able to drink Cristal and drink the best of the best, fly on private jets. You've seen what, how you could feed your family. And now being able to have all of that becomes more important than even your own self, even really your own family. If you don't have a dime in your pocket, you can still feed your family. There are food banks. There are churches. There's a church, multiple churches on every corner. That's called, I pos- I'm in my mind so that I can be okay with what I did. I'm, j- I'm positioning myself as a victim. See, men, women will say I stayed for my kids. Men will say I did it to feed my family. It's the same bogus excuse. I know how this sounds if you don't have real world experience. It sounds harsh. It sounds unreal. But I'm telling you, and multiple people who've been in the field will tell you, whether they were therapists, social workers, even teachers, it doesn't matter. They will tell you there is a difference between being a victim of an incident of violence versus being a victim holistically in the situation. If you only knew how many people were never victims, they just positioned themselves to be that. Because, well, for instance, well, it is illegal to hold somebody against their will. That's illegal. It's illegal to drug people. It's illegal to put something in somebody's drink or in their food to make them acquiesce more easily to your request. That's all illegal. We know that. It's illegal to bribe people. It's illegal to pressure people to do something for you. So if somebody who was in the circle, in the company, can position themselves behind that illegal thing, then people are going to believe they were a victim. And then people without real world experience will say, well, yeah, but look at this and look at that and look at the power dynamic and look at this. So yeah, they were a victim. (laughs) And you can't say none of that because you know they don't have real world experience. And some people think their own abusive situation is real world experience. No, that's your experience. Real world experience, y'all, is when you've been out there in the world and you've talked to, worked with, however it goes, Hundreds, some of you, thousands, I was only in the work for 18 years. Some of you were in it for much longer than I was. Only a fool says a person's experience doesn't matter. You can't get a job without experience. If you do, you're going to get an entry level job and you're going to get paid less than those who have experience. Why? Because experience matters, y'all. So that's why he wants to testify, I believe. At least in my experience, that's why any Perk wanted to testify. I'm going to tell him this and I'm going to tell him this and I'm going to show this. And but best believe, oh boy, probably kept really good records. I mean, at some point he probably did realize from lawsuits back in the 90s that people could position themselves as victims. So then you might need to have more evidence. You may need to have the recording of when you told Cassie, I I ain't giving you $500,000 no more. I'm only going to give you $250,000. So Now, am I saying that it makes Sean right for all the things he did? Now, you know what? If you're thinking that, I don't even know what to say to that. Well, I do. That would mean you've gotten really triggered and you're no longer thinking, which is what happens to me and the rest of us. When we get emotionally triggered by something someone's saying, we stop thinking. Literally. I mean, that's science. We stop thinking. Our emotions take over. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. You know, two things, three things, four things can be true all at the same time. The man is a dirty dog. He's horrible. But that doesn't make it right to position yourself as a victim either. It doesn't make it right for you then to position yourself behind the law when you know you were there willfully. You took all of it willfully. Why would a man bend over? I can't understand that. Ain't nothing that I would want bad enough. Nothing. That I would be willing to do certain things. I just said, well, you know what, honey, we're going to all starve tonight. (laughs) 
If this what mama got to do, if this what daddy got, we're going to all starve. Not just you. Are we starving too? <laughs> you know, but again, as I said, no one starved. No one, no one uh, is going to starve. Despite the flaws and the faults of our country, there are some really good parts of it. All kinds of organizations, all kind the Catholic charities. I mean, we, I used to call upon the Catholic charities a lot for people I knew. They'll bring you a box of food. Now, again, it won't be steak and potatoes. See, that's what people want. It might just be a box of cereal and some grits and a, a, a little package of oatmeal, but that'll feed you. Well, I want grape soda. Well, then you're going to starve. <laughs> if that's what you're going to call starve, the privilege to choose what you want to eat, is it really is a privilege. Even if you live in a food desert, organizations will bring food to that place. So I think that's what he's going to say. Something like that. I think he's going to share that. Not to mention, he's probably going to just, of course, try to make us all understand his own psychology. He's going to tell us his stories of abuse. Um, And I believe he was abused as a child. A lot of you know, I also believe Sean is a product of incest. And a lot of people ask me to talk about that. I won't talk about that any further because I got to be careful about the YouTube algorithm and the, uh, you know, such and such and so and so. And that's something really that I would need to have time to explain. But I think he's going to explain his own childhood. I think he's going to try to explain what, what made him into the monster he is how he got into the drugs. He was abused. He was sexually abused by X, Y, and Z. And the nightmares were so great. He got on the drugs and then the drugs became a way of coping. And then that became an addiction. I think he's going to tell it because that's actually with a lot of people, how their addictions develop. They're trying to cope with some emotion, some trauma. We all know that that also is literature, right? So Again, I'm speaking only about this situation. I don't want anyone to take my words out of context and try to apply them and cut and paste them to some other situation or some other thing that we are simply not talking about here in this conversation, which people, when they get triggered, they tend to do. Oh, oh, oh. So then that over there, are you saying, see, anytime we start going there, that means we've been triggered. I have to remind myself of that. Anytime I start saying to somebody. Oh, so are you trying to say that means I, that all that means is I got triggered. <laughs> and instead of going inward, I'm going outward. I'm going to now try to put it on you. Are you trying to say instead of going in and say, wait a minute, why did hearing that really tick me off so bad? What did it touch on? What source spot in my soul did it touch on? Because that means in that particular area, I got a little bit more work to do. A little bit more healing to go. So those are my thoughts on him, uh, on Mark saying he's going to testify. Now, then there's the other side of this. Will he actually testify? I mean, maybe that's just something he's saying now. Maybe Puffy is so angry because he's been ripped from his illustrious lifestyle. And, you know, there's the whole pile on effect. Um, maybe he's just so angry right now that he's saying, I'm going to testify. But who knows? Maybe after he has detox, which that's if he makes it to the detox. I remember... Uh, people used to tell me that the worst pain they ever had in their life was going through a detox. Their body was in physical pain. There's constant vomiting. There's um, all kinds of hallucinations. It's, they said they felt like they were literally going to die. So I'm sure he's going um, through that 10 times over. So when he come back to his clear mind, which who knows being in jail may be the first time in a number of decades that he's actually been clear minded enough to actually see the things, how horrible he's behaved, the horrible things he's done, the horrible person he became. Right. But at any rate, so maybe when he comes through the detox and all of that, maybe he will see it differently and he'll understand it really is way too dangerous for you to get on the stand and try to testify because you may, you may break down during the cross examination. You may not be able to, you know, listen, a jury is going to have to decide your fate and you need to really think about that. So that's just what they're saying now that he's, or I should say his attorney is saying now that he's going to testify. What do you guys think about this? What do you think about the fact that he wants to testify? And and, and, and from your vantage point, what could he possibly testify to? Because he's saying, 
they're lying on me. I want to defend myself. See, I think when he says they're lying on me, what he's thinking about is you weren't a victim. <laughs> you know, you were, <laughs> you know, you was down for the parties. You wanted to be drugged so that you could be free. I told y'all when we were covering, uh, what's his name? Nelly, the Nelly arrest at the casino. I was like, why did he have, why did he have ecstasy in his pocket for ecstasy pills? Because he has a real specific thing to have. That means you wanted to get yourself in a space where you could be free to do whatever you wanted. And y'all, there are some people. Now, this may sound, I want you just to hear me out. They want to be drugged. Because if they are not drugged, they can't go to those certain places. If you know what I mean, I don't mean physical places. They can't go to certain places. You say, well, I just can't understand. Child, I can't either. Like, I can't understand what the man's going to say on the documentary. But see, most of us know, no. There are too many people who've said, no, I don't want nothing that bad. Remember uh, Torre, uh, music critic, Arthur, um, commentator, podcaster Torre. He gave the story of his family member who he set up. He said, I called, this was years ago. He said, I called Puffy to get my family member who was a male this internship. And he said a few months had passed by and the, you know, the man was calling him with all these praise reports. Oh, it's going so great. We did this. We flew over here. We did this. We talked to such and such. We went on this interview and then he learned from the guy. I'm no longer at the internship. And he said it was years later that the man revealed to him what happened. What happened? What happened was he said, Puffy told him if you want to continue this internship, you're going to have to come home with me. And what did the man say? Uh-uh. Deuces. See, that was not a victim in any way, shape, or form. When the proposition came, he said no. Why? Because he didn't want the internship that bad. I don't want the access to power, money, celebrity that bad. Another example. Remember the whole Lizzo lawsuit when those girls... Sue Lizzo for sexual harassment. And they talked about in their lawsuit how she forced us at a club to put our mouth on that woman's vagina and eat the banana. But see, what they didn't talk about is the other girls who were in the company that night. I think, was it Australia, wherever they were out of the country? There were other girls who knew how Lizzo liked to get down at her parties. So after the, the, the concert they did, When it was time to go to the nightclub, there were those other girls that said, no, we're we're not going. We're not going. So they went back to the hotel. The other girls who wanted to be on front, dancing up front, because that's what the girls said in their lawsuit. If you didn't do certain things, you wouldn't get to dance up front. You wouldn't get to go on the yacht. So what is they what are they really saying? I want to dance up front so bad. I want to be on the yacht so bad. I will. I'm willing to do really whatever. But see, you can't really say that. You have to position yourself as a victim if you didn't do it. So what about the girls who said, I don't mind dancing in the back, child. I'm just happy I'm on the stage with Lizzo. Why ain't that enough? When our ambition becomes higher than our self-love, our self-respect, guys, we are putting ourselves in a position to do some dangerous things. And because, well, it is illegal to harass people, you see, you can position your position yourself behind that and say, I was a victim. As I told you guys, when we talked about that. None of those girls were victims. They all wanted to do it because they wanted what they wanted so bad. They didn't mind putting their mouth on another woman's vagina. They didn't mind eating it, eating the banana out of her uh, vagina. They didn't mind. They really didn't. But they get, they can't say if you say that, then people will know what you're really about. They'll know. They'll know, ain't nothing you won't do. And how many times have we heard the stories, read the stories of men and women who they wanted what they wanted so bad, they didn't care if they had to step on people to get ahead, if they had to lie on people to get ahead, if they had to steal to get ahead. I just want to get ahead. Have we forgotten that there are men and women in the world like that? And then let's talk about this too. Okay, let's just say for someone who's saying that he or she was a victim, you went to a party, you woke up, you realize you obviously have been drugged and you could feel from your own body sensations, obviously taken advantage of sexually. How do you explain going to the next party? 
How do you explain that? How do you explain? Well, I was going to lose the recording contract. Oh, now we know. Now we know. Oh, you were a victim, but then you no longer were one when you decided, I want that recording contract so bad. I'm going to go back to a next another party and just hope this time he won't drug me. Like little Rod Jones has positioned himself as a victim. But you as a grown, fully grown man, you moved into the house with him. Why did you have to move in with him? Especially in this day in technology, you have people in London recording their part of the contract, working on their part of the contract, and then someone in the in, in the U.S. doing theirs. And the engineer can merge it all together why, where we would think y'all was in the same room. No, you moved in because you wanted something. And it was so, your ambition, whatever it was, was so great, you're willing to take a chance on anything. Folks, there are people like that. We can't intellectually understand that. But we know there are people in the world like that. And the saddest thing is when they get to the top, they're going to realize like what we hear all these people say, when they get to the top, they realize it was none of it was worth it. None of it was worth it. Sometimes we look at people, we say, why was such and such a one hit wonder? Why was so and so never heard from again? Sometimes it's because they said, like the boy said, I don't want the internship that bad. If I got to sing in the nightclubs for the rest of my life, if that's how people get to hear the beautiful voice God gave me, all right, I'm going to have to settle on that. But I'm not willing to do X, Y, and Z to get ahead. I'm not willing. And, you know, bravo to the men and women who have said that. Their story doesn't get told enough. We only hear about the people who were willing to do whatever to get where they wanted to go. And then they position themselves as victims and then everybody feels sorry for them. And then they go on, they get their big fat check. But here's the thing about life. Our conscience knows and our conscience is separate and independent from us. That's why we could be doing right and hearing in ourselves that's wrong. The function, the, the conscience functions independently of our own mind is what I'm saying. When I say it functions independently of us, our thinking, Right. So our conscience knows. I can tell you exactly what's going to happen to Cassie. Would you like to know? Not because I have a crystal ball, just because of experience. When people position themselves, be they male or female, to be victims, when they know they really weren't, their conscience knows you really were down for all of it. It's just that right now you have an opportunity to set yourself up for the rest of your life financially, you and your kids or what have you. So if you just say it this way, you're going to quote unquote get away with it. What happens is the conscience demands, and a lot of you've heard me teach on this. We talked about um, that guy uh, who went to uh, the whole George Floyd thing and he murdered those people, Kyle Rittenhouse. I talked about this. One of the things that the conscience is tasked with doing, it demands justice. It demands that we do the right thing. It demands that of us. It's our own internal GPS system. Our conscience demands right actions. It, and when we get off course and whatever way we do, whether it's position ourselves as a victim, well, then the conscience begins on this thing of trying to get us back on track. And when we won't do that, sickness is our result. We become sick physically. We become sick emotionally, mentally even. But see, on the surface, it could just seem like this person was so traumatized. They just went crazy when in actuality, that's really not what happened. What I can tell you guys is that if it's true that Cassie was not a victim holistically, which is what I believe, her conscience knows that. She knows that. And what will happen? What is this? 2023? We'll probably hear in some years to come that she is very ill. Sickness is tied to so many things, not just the way we eat, the way we whatever. But see, you have to talk to people and know these things. I'm so grateful. You know, a lot of times you don't really know what's going on. You know, you you just have a job. You're trying to pay your own bills. You don't know that this is a part of your own life's training for whatever you're going to be doing later. Now, during those times, I was very, a lot of you've heard me say this. I wish now I would have kept a notebook of things I learned. 
because it helped me in my own life. It helped me heal in my in areas of my own life. Because I'd be interviewing somebody and I'd be thinking to myself, because if you're if you're the kind of person that's like, what can I learn from this? And so many of us in the listening audience are, I was like, you know what, yeah, I'm doing that too. And I I had enough sense to recognize, well, if I don't change my ways, I'm gonna wind up in the same situation the person I'm interviewing is in. See, I'm not special. I don't have any anything different than they have. And so I would just Make a mental note. I need to change X, Y, and Z. I need to stop doing X, Y, Z and start doing X, Y, Z. Or else I'm going to take the same path eventually. Eventually, I'm going to get on the no outlet road just like they're on right now. And God forbid, somebody have to then turn around and be interviewing me for something. Sending me to therapy for something. So very often, what's on the surface is so... I mean, we just don't know, y'all, a lot of times... I will tell you in everything I learned, this is probably the major thing. It's like an iceberg. You see the top, but you don't see the bottom. And in order to truly understand what really went on, the reasons things really are the way they are, you really got to see the bottom. And the only way we're going to see the bottom in situations is if people are honest. See, I was in a situation where people were forced to be honest with me or else it's like you're going to go to jail. You know, or you're going to, you know, whatever. So, you know, in situations like that, people will still lie sometimes, a whole lot of times. But then eventually they come back around and say, well, well, yeah, yeah. I thought you said you didn't, you know. Well, yeah, I did. And then, too, another thing I learned. People don't. I used to think people lie because they're just bad people. I learned a lot of times people lie because they're just scared. And I learned to have compassion for those people. Okay, I understand you were scared. If I, Then if I can put myself in your shoes, I would have lied, too, because I would be scared. Don't nobody want to go to jail. Don't nobody want to, you know, because if you go to jail, who's going to take care of your kids? You know, who's going to do this? Who's gonna, you know, all these things. Right. So a lot of times people lie because they're scared. They're not bad people. Technically, they just are scared. And we've all been scared of losing something, a job, a relationship, our health, our whatever. So we just go in denial about these things. And so as I get ready to wrap this up, I think this, if he does testify, and of course, this is a long way off, unless guys, some miracle happens and the feds can speed this up and the test, uh, the trial begins in 2025, which we're just a few months from, but is projected to not begin until the latter half of 2025, maybe going into 2026 by the experts in the um, legal field. But, you know, things can change on a dime. It just depends on what happens. And of course, if he kills himself or if somebody kills him, there won't be no trial, right? We'll never know what he had to say. We'll never know. And of course, then there'll be somebody who writes us some kind of letter and say, this was the letter we found in his cell and they make a million dollars off the letter, right? Uh, So guys, there you have it. Those are my thoughts on this whole situation from Mark um, saying he wants to get on the stand and I'm going to have to let him. He's the only person really fit to defend himself. What do you guys think about it? Leave your thoughts below and I'll talk to you on the next podcast.